Om Namah Shivaya. I'm so happy to be able to be with you to give you this talk this evening. As you know, it was originally supposed to be two days ago, and I'm happy to say that uh, I'm feeling much better, that the, uh, the accident was uh, much milder than we had been concerned about, and so uh, I'm just happy to be here with all of you. I also once again want to thank the Shivananda uh, uh, Center here in the Bahamas for hosting this conference, and particularly Swami Surupananda, who has inspired this conference and has inspired bringing together uh, so many wonderful uh, educational programs here at the ashram. I feel it's such a blessing for all of us to be able to gather in this sangha, in this community, and to be able to gather together in the spirit of really of pursuing truth, the spirit of pursuing the divine, the spirit of pursuing the heart. And I feel that there is so much heart to be found here in this ashram, and I'm just so happy to, uh, to be invited to be here. So thank you all very, very much. Now, I'd like to, uh, tonight, talk about the churning of the oceans of consciousness, and uh, this is a traditional story that has its origins in the uh, Puranas, and the, uh, the Puranas are uh, post-Vedic texts, I guess you could say they date back somewhere between 500 and 1500 BC. So they're really quite old. And the Puranas are uh, storytelling texts that tell the knowledge of the Vedas through stories. And one of the most important stories is the story that I'll be telling you tonight, Samudra Mantan. And it's a very, very important story to the tradition of yoga and the tradition of Ayurveda. In fact, I believe that if you understand this story deeply enough that all of the secrets of yoga and all of the secrets of Ayurveda can be found within this story. This picture that is behind me on the right will come up in this story. And this is a picture of Lord Dhanvantari. And Lord Dhanvantari is the primal deity of Ayurveda, the primal deity of healing in yoga. And we could say that... Uh, Lord Dhanvantri will be the culmination of this story. And there's a mantra next to Lord Dhanvantri that you see on the screen, or you may be able to see on the screen. And it's a mantra that's just four simple words. This is the most simple way to invoke the divine healer, to devoke Lord Dhanvantri, because Lord Dhanvantri is the divine healer. And so when we say the mantra, Om Dhanvantara Murtaye Namaha, we're simply invoking the divine healer within our hearts. And it is said in Ayurveda that you cannot teach the knowledge of Ayurveda without the blessings of the divine healer. You cannot learn Ayurveda without the blessings of the divine healer. And you cannot be healed without the blessings of the divine healer. And of course, this depiction of the divine healer that you see here is just that. It is an image. It is a depiction. The divine healer is the essence of the power of healing of the universe that is present within each and every individual. And it emanates, according to Ayurveda, from the heart. So what I'd like to ask you to do right now is just to close your eyes and bring your attention to your hearts. And we're going to chant this mantra together nine times as we invoke Lord Danvantri, or the healer that exists within each one of us to bring about that state of balance, that state of peace. Om Danvantra Murtaye Namaha Om Danvantra Murtaye Namaha Om Danvantara 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 Murtaye Namaha The 
just allow that vibration to move throughout every cell of your body, to vibrate out from your heart, awakening the healer in every cell. Namaste. So once upon a time, every good story starts out with once upon a time. I wish we all had popcorn to eat or something like that. And Once upon a time, there was a great sage by the name of Durvasa. And Durvasa was a great and powerful sage. And what made him powerful was that he was so devotional. He was devoted to a god, the form of God that he was devoted to is Lord Indra, a Vedic god. He was very, very devotional. He, he worshipped you know, Lord Indra. And the culmination of bhakti, the culmination of the love that you have for your Ishta Devata is when that Ishta Devata, that, that, that vision of the divine appears before you, speaks to you. This is a, a big moment when that happens. Well, Durvasa was a farmer. He was a simple farmer. And he was out in the fields one day, and there he is out in the fields tending to the gardens, when all of a sudden, in the distance, he sees a great elephant. And this great elephant is coming toward him, and that captures his attention. On top of that elephant is sitting Lord Indra. Now, he sees Lord Indra coming toward him on this elephant, and this is it. This is the moment that he has looked for his whole life, that he has devoted himself to his whole life. All of his pujas, all of his mantras, all of his heart, all of his mind has been absorbed in Lord, Dan Van, uh, in, in Lord Indra. And now Lord Indra is appearing before him. So he quickly puts together from the flowers in the field a garland puts it together very quickly so he can make an offering to this great deity that is appearing before him. He puts it all together. And then th when the deity arrives on top of the elephant, he, of course, prostrates, bowing down, surrendering his ego. He prostrates and he offers to Lord Indra this garland of flowers. Lord Indra takes the garland, accepts it, and is about to put it on his head when he thinks to himself, no, wait a minute. I want to show the sage Durvasa how selfless I am. So I'm going to put this on the trunk of my elephant. And so he puts it on the trunk of the elephant. Now, elephants in Vedic stories represent the ability to see the most subtle things. Elephants help you to, to see truth when you s hear this in stories. Well, this elephant by the name of Aravata. Aravata knows because he can see the subtle within Lord Indra. He knows that Lord Indra is not egoless. He knows that Lord, Lord Indra is not perfectly selfless. He feels like he is pretending. So instead of accepting the garland, Aravata drops the garland in the mud, steps forward and steps on the garland. The sage Durvasa is just speechless, He's beside himself. He, here he has spent his whole life or much of his life, in devotion to Lord Indra, he has given him a gift, and in his mind, in his heart, that gift has been spurned. That gift has been rejected. All he knows is he gave it to his elephant who dropped it in the mud, who stepped on it. And that's all he knows. Well, you could imagine that the sage Devasa is very angry. Oh, he's very angry in that moment. And in that moment, he's so angry that he curses Lord Indra. He curses God. Oh. 
Lord, uh, the sage Dervasa is a powerful, powerful sage. When he curses God, it rocks the heavens. Now, in the Vedic teachings, there are three worlds. There is the physical world that we all share. There is the subtle world, which is the world sometimes described as the atmosphere. And there is the heavenly world beyond that. And when the sage Dervasa curses God, well, the gods, the devatas, the gods, lose control of the three worlds. What does it mean to lose control of the three worlds? In the story, in these Vedic stories, the gods are often battling with the demons. And so they lose control of the three worlds. And the demons start gaining control of the three worlds. And you can imagine now that havoc is reigning. It's a terrible thing. Well, Lord Indra, upon experiencing this, you know, he, he doesn't know what to do except to go to an even greater God than him. Because in the, in the Hindu, Hindu pantheon of gods and the pre-Vedic gods, there are kind of hierarchies. So in this story, the, the God of all is Lord Vishnu. This story comes from the Vishnu Purana. So Lord Vishnu, he goes to Lord Vishnu and he says, Lord Vishnu, something terrible has happened. We've lost control of the three worlds. Indra was also the God of heaven. He says, we've lost control of the three worlds. This is terrible. You have to help us. So Lord Indra says, very well, I will help you. But here's what you have to do. You are going to have to churn the oceans. And in order to churn the oceans, you will need a great mountain to put in the center of it, a snake to wrap around it, and you will have to work with the demons to churn it back and forth like this. And out of the ocean will arise a nectar. And the nectar, if you have just one drop of it, you will regain control of the three worlds. And there will be peace in the three worlds. But you must convince the demons to work with you. And so Indra sets off to speak to the demons. And sure enough, the demons agree. Why would they agree? Well, because they figure, being demons, hey, if we can get the nectar for ourselves, we will be all powerful. We will never lose control of the three worlds. This could be the greatest thing of all. So sure, we'll work with you. So they enroll a great serpent demon by the name of Vasuki. Vasuki wraps himself around the mountain. And the devatas, which are the gods, they take control of, they take hold of the tail. And the demons take hold of the, of the head. The demons are also called the, the asuras. They take control of the head. And they begin to churn back and forth. But all that happens is this mountain, Mount Mandhara, this mountain, like a corkscrew, goes into the bottom of the ocean and nothing happens. No nectar appears. Upon seeing this, Lord Vishnu sees that they need some help. So Lord Vishnu takes incarnation as a giant tortoise, Korma, the tortoise. A giant tortoise and swims to the bottom of the ocean and allows the mountain to rest on its back and is perfectly still. So he pulls in his arms, his legs, and his head and he remains perfectly still. And the demons and the gods churn back and forth, back and forth. And now the ocean begins to 
go through a transformation. And out of the ocean rises something, but it's not the nectar. The first thing to arise out of the ocean is the hal hal, which is a great poison. It's a poison that rises out of the ocean and threatens through its toxicity to destroy all three worlds. Upon seeing this, Shiva, one of the, the, the devatas, the gods that's turning the ocean, says, I got this one, and swallows all the poison. And they continue to churn back and forth, back and forth. Many other articles arise out of the ocean, and each is an important story that I won't have time to tell you tonight. But the final article to arrive out of the ocean, what rises last after all the churning of the ocean, is Lord Dunvantry. That's what you see symbolized here in this picture. You can't see it, but it looks like he's arising from an ocean of milk because the ocean is likened to milk just as milk gets transformed into cream and butter. Likewise, the ocean of our consciousness gets transformed. The ocean gets transformed. And so out of the ocean, from all that churning, rises the amrit, the, the amrit, is in a pot which Lord Dunvantri is holding, the sacred nectar. Lord Dunvantri rises with a pot in his hands, and in that pot, the kumba, in that pot is the amrit, the nectar. Just one drop is all they need to regain control of the three worlds forever. Now the demons see it and they get very excited. The gods see it and they get very excited. Now let me ask you a question. Who do you think got the amrit? Who got the pot? Who took the pot? Who got the nectar? Those of you that haven't heard this story before. I've told this story before. So who do you think received the nectar? Do you think it's the gods? And they gained control of the three worlds? Or do you think it's the demons? And they gained control of the three worlds. How many hands do we have for the demons? How many hands do we have for the gods? All right. And a lot of you are just too shy or not sure to vote. All right. So you're split pretty even. Well, the demons being demons, they're very sneaky. They're very tricky and they're not very polite. So as soon as they saw it rise up, they dove on it. Meanwhile, the gods were like, hey, it's rising out of the ocean. We should go and get it. Do you want to get it? No, I'll get it. Okay. Before they even had time to process that, the demons took the pot. But being demons, they started fighting over it. Oh, they started fighting over it. Give it to me. No, give it to me. It's mine. No, it's mine. And they started playing keep away from each other with one running away and then the other one running away with it. And they were so busy fighting about it that they didn't have time to take a drop. Meanwhile, the gods went back to Lord Vishnu and said, Lord Vishnu, something terrible has happened. The demons got the elixir. We need your help again. Lord Vishnu said, I can see that that's a big problem. Okay, I'll help you. Lord Vishnu takes incarnation as the most beautiful, the most seductive, the most attractive being ever created, the most gorgeous woman, Mohini. And Mohini appears before the demons, and the demons are busy fighting over it, but as soon as they see Mohini, they stop, they freeze, they look at her. <gasps> they don't know what to do. They're just completely mesmerized by her beauty. And Mohini says to them, Give me the elixir, and I'll make sure that you all get a drop, each of you, the demons, and all of the gods. And the demons go, okay, whatever you want, because they're in her spell. They give her the pot, 
And the demons and, the, and Mohini has all the gods line up and gives each of them a drop, one drop. And just as she is about to give a drop to the demons, she disappears, leaving the demons high and dry. Now, this story is told many different ways. It's told also in the, in the, uh, 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 it's told in the Vishnu, it's told actually in all 18 Puranas. It's also told in the Mahabharata. So there are a few different endings to this story. In one of the endings, there is a demon who sees at the last minute that Mohini has tricked them because she had them under her spell. And she reaches out, uh, the demon reaches out for the nectar and knocks the pot and a drop, two drops fall to the earth. In another story, as the, as the pot drops, the demon grabs one and puts it in his mouth. And then seeing that, one of the gods quickly cuts off the demon's head. Try to get rid of the demon. For those of you who study Vedic astrology, Jyotish, this is the story of Rahu and Ketu and their origins in this mythological story. But I'm not going to go into that, but it's relevant to Vedic astrology. And for those of you who have heard in yoga not to eat garlic and onions, you've heard of this, because they will cause disturbances. It is because out of these two drops that fell to the earth grew garlic and onions. And they are tainted by the touch of the demon. And this is why they are considered to be very rajasic meaning that they will create disturbances in the mind, not that they can't be used as medicine, but they will create disturbances in the mind, too much stimulation. Now, why am I telling you this story? Well, there's a, some good reasons. I'm going to tell you again this story, but I'm going to tell it to you from another perspective. Now I want you to imagine that you are the sage Durvasa. Because each of you are in this story. You are the sage Durvasa and you are on your spiritual path. Aren't you all on a spiritual path? You've been doing whatever your traditions are, whatever your practices are, you're on a spiritual path. You feel like you want to know God. You feel like you want to know that which is greater than yourself. And you practice. So you have practices that you do, and you come here and you learn more practices. But sometimes, perhaps you have felt spurned by God, where God wasn't listening to you. You prayed and God did not listen. Or you thought to yourself, if there was a God, how could God do this? How could God create famines or wars? Or maybe something happened to a dear friend or a close loved one of yours. How could God do that? And maybe you got angry at God. And maybe you even cursed God. Have you ever cursed God? I know. I know that almost everybody has at some time taken the Lord's, vein in name, uh, Lord's name in vain. Sometimes we've said terrible things. In anger, in pain, inside of us. And when we do that, we lose control of the three worlds. Now, what does that mean? Well, the demons represent our ego. And the devatas, the gods, represent our higher self or our soul, our atman in the story. And the ocean is your personal consciousness that is being churned. And when we curse God, 
we're cursing our higher self. And when we lose control of the three worlds, we lose control of body, mind, and consciousness, personal consciousness. And when that happens, we become sick. We become physically sick. We become psychologically sick. And we become spiritually wounded in that it becomes more difficult to perceive our connectedness to the whole, the oneness inherent in all of creation. And that's what happens when we curse at God. We lose control. And then, to regain control, we have to churn the ocean. We have to churn the ocean of our own consciousness, which means we're going to have to engage the demons. Yeah, the shadow, the darkness, the ego. It's your partner on your spiritual path. You can't deny it. It's your partner on your spiritual path. And your higher self, your Atman, you have to engage. And together they will churn your personal consciousness as you struggle for your healing healing of body, mind, and consciousness. And I know you know that struggle. I know you know the suffering that comes as you go through that struggle. Each of us suffers in our own way. Some physically, some psychologically, some existentially. But we all suffer in our own way. And we're all on a healing journey physically, emotionally, and spiritually. As the oceans are churned within us, our personal consciousness, the first thing to arise is the halhala. This is the poison. So here you are doing all the spiritual work, and what do you get? Negativity. More pain. More suffering. Negativity. Reinforcement for all the negative things in your life. Oh, it's even more challenging now when you first start the spiritual path. That's the most difficult time. That's the most difficult time. You will face your demons, the darkness. Yeah. And what does the story teach us to do with that? The only way out of that negativity is to turn it over to Shiva to turn it over to God in any form you like, but to turn it over to the divine, to let go of it and give it and offer it to the divine. That could be Lord Shiva, that could be Mother Earth, that could be what you relate to as greater than yourself, but you must let it go. You must let go of your pain, you must let go of your suffering, you must let go of those, those hurts, the deepest hurts. That's turning it over to God. And then we continue to churn. There's many more things that arise. But the final thing to arise is Lord Nunvantri coming out of the ocean, holding the Amrit, the sacred nectar. And even when that happens, there are those demons again. All that spiritual work, you're so spiritually advanced, you've been doing so much sadhana, and the demons show up. And they take the Amrit and they start fighting over it. And perhaps that's when we, because that's our ego, our ego feeds on that, that holding on to the Amrit, not really eating it, but holding on to it and thinking, oh, we are so special because we are so spiritual. Look at all this work I've done. Now my ego is powerful. Now my ego is very powerful. I can do all kinds of great things. I can be a great teacher. I can be a great spiritual teacher. And you can pay me lots of money. Or I will have lots of respect. I will have this. I will have that. I, 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 I. As the ego feeds on its possession of the Ambudit. And then eventually on the spiritual journey, Mohini shows up. Because Mohini is your greatest desire. What does Mohini represent? Mohini represents your desire for enlightenment, 
your desire for eternal bliss, your highest desire for peace, and it only shows up after you've come to realize that your ego will never lead you there, even with all the power in the world. Even with all the power in the world, you'd be the most powerful person in the world and not be happy and content. You could probably think of some examples. And so, Mohini will show up. Mohini is not a person. Mohini is the desire for self-realization. And she will trick your ego, just like she tricked the demons. Give me the Amrit. And she will give it to the higher self. Mohini will lead your ego to the precipice of self-realization, but you can never cross it. Not until you give up. Your ego gives up the Amrit. Only then can you reach self-realization and enlightenment. Only when you, when you give up that elixir, you are surrendering your ego. You are surrendering your individuality and embracing your interconnectedness with all of creation. Then when you look into the world, all you see is the divine in all of its faces, in all of its shapes, in all of its forms. Without judgment, without attachment, that's all you see. Now, a few more components of this story to understand. To be successful churning the oceans, you needed a tortoise. You needed korma, remember, to swim to the bottom? The tortoise represents your five senses. But more than that, the tortoise represents withdrawing your five senses and pulling them inward into the shell. In yoga, this is pratyahara. You cannot successfully churn the ocean if your senses are being misused. Ayurveda teaches that the one of the causes of disease, the main causes of disease, is the misuse of our senses, the overuse of our senses, or the underuse of our senses, or the misuse of our senses. When we take in through our eyes, our ears, our nose, our mouth, or our, our, our touch, that which is disharmonious for us. If we are stimulating ourselves through our five senses, the tortoise will neither, never be still. So Ayurveda teaches that there is a proper way to use our five senses. And a vast amount of the Ayurvedic knowledge is the pursuit of the understanding of how to properly use your five senses through diet, aromas, colors, and sights, mantras, and sounds, touch. And there's no one way to use it right, but rather you have to first understand your constitution, and you must understand the nature of the imbalance within you. And only Ayurveda says that when you understand the nature of your constitution, prakriti, and the nature of your imbalance, vikriti, will you ever be able to understand what is right for you. Ayurveda will never say everybody must do this or everybody must do that. But rather, Ayurveda will always say, who are you? What are your individual needs? In the story, too, there was a mountain. And the mountain represents our steadfast commitment to the churning because it's hard to keep on churning. It's hard to keep on going. It's so hard to keep on going. When the poison arises and, and then the demons steal the nectar, it's so hard to keep on going. But we must have that steadfast commitment. And the serpent, Vasuki, the great king of the demons, Nagashesha, Vasuki represents the demon of time and the demon of desire. They're related to one another. There is no desire if there is not time. Because desire is that which you crave 
to come to you. It is in the future. But in this story, to keep it simple, we must, of course, control our desires and it is going to take time to churn the ocean. It is very difficult to all of a sudden just wake up. Yes, you can, especially if you're ready. But it's going to take time for most people to churn the oceans. And a steadfast commitment. But here's the good news. In the end, you're all going to be enlightened. In the end, you're all going to reach self-realization. In the end, you're all going to become one with all of creation. You will become the essence of creation, the swarup. You will become that divine essence. It's guaranteed, but it's a long journey through many, 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 many lifetimes. For most people, not that I invite the Vedantas, it doesn't have to be. But for most of us, because of the struggle, it will be. It will take time. And I'd like you to know that first and foremost, become comfortable with where you are right now on the journey and accept yourself for where you are. Love yourself for where you are and know that wherever you are on the journey, you are on the journey. And the fact that you're here says a lot about how far you've come on that journey. Love yourself. Keep allowing yourself to churn that ocean. Keep doing the work. We're so blessed with the teachings of Swami Shivananda and the teachings of Swami Vishnu Devananda in this tradition that provide guidance as you churn the oceans, provide guidance about how to churn those oceans, provide guidance to sadhana. And of course, all the yogic traditions are traditions where where you learn that which you need to know in order to move forward on your journey. That's what yoga is. To unite, to become one with that which is greater than yourself. Because at the end of this journey, the karma that binds together your ego and your soul, your atman, they're bind. I look at them as though they were sewn together by the threads of karma. All that karma is setting up the poison that's going to rise. But as you heal from that poison, you are healing that karma and you are cutting the threads. And liberation is where, where the threads of karma no longer bind your soul to your ego. And the ego disappears because it is transient. And the soul remains and becomes one because it is eternal. All of Ayurveda, all of yoga, is really the path of attaining this through, of course, karma yoga and jnana yoga and bhakti yoga, raja yoga. Ayurveda is the science of how to stay healthy as you are on your yogic journey. Ayurveda is the healing side of yoga. They come from the same philosophy, from Sankhya philosophy. Ayurveda is the, and, and Ayurveda borrows a lot from yoga too. But Ayurveda is the healing side of yoga. As you travel down the yogic path, you will inevitably cross the road of Ayurveda because it is the yogic science of healing. It is the original yoga therapy. It is the only traditional yoga therapy. And as you travel down the road of Ayurveda, you will always come to the crossroad of yoga. Because unless you are following a path to inner peace, you can never balance the doshas. Ahimsa is such a big part of yoga, and it is a big part of Ayurveda. And it is one of those principles that binds them together. It says in the Charaka Samhita, that if you do not practice ahimsa, that you cannot balance the doshas, that you cannot support ojas. You must practice ahimsa. It also says that the cause of disease 
is due to imbalances of vata, of pitta, of kappa, of rajas, and of tamas. Only sattva does not cause disease, does not cause suffering. And when you are on the yogic path, the traditional yogic paths, there are nonconformist yoga paths. You're on the traditional yoga path. It is a sattvic path. So, tomorrow, I will be sharing with you the mythology and the meaning behind it for Yoga Nidra, which I'm so excited to see that there is a new Murti year this year. You could see Lord Vishnu laying in Yoga Nidra. Is Lord Narayana, means resting on water. And so we are so blessed. Tomorrow we will be here talking about Yoga Nidra, and we are so blessed with this beautiful, beautiful Murti. Practically new. And I will talk about the science behind it too, because the science of Yoga Nidra, you will come to see that r tremendous research has been done that shows that it benefits diabetes, the autonomic nervous system, the heart, heart irregularities, reduces pain, so many things. So we'll go through that tomorrow too. And we'll look at what some great masters have had to say about Yoga Nidra. And that'll be at noon. And I'll also tell you my story. And I'll tell you why I didn't sleep for seven years. And it has to do with a terrible disease I suffered in 1987 that crippled me. And I'll talk about how I healed from that through the practices of Ayurveda and Yoga Nidra. And then we will get to practice Yoga Nidra together. And we will practice Yoga Nidra at 2 o'clock tomorrow. And I'll take you through a 45-minute meditation. Please bring a pillow. Please bring a thin covering for yourself if you're concerned about bugs or anything else. But please bring anything you need to make yourself comfortable. And we will be laying down like a yoga class, but it will be Yoga Nidra, which is yogic sleep. But you will not be asleep. You will be awake. Completely awake. Comple you laugh? <laughs> <laughs> Completely awake and completely aware, and that's my job to try to help you to stay awake and aware. And I teach a, a five-day certification course in becoming an instructor of Yoga Nidra here at this center in May, and I'll be joined by my partner in teaching and my partner in life, and that's Dr. Andrea Dearhart, who is right here. And so she will be co-teaching with me that course in May, and she'll be assisting tomorrow uh, in that workshop as well. So I want to thank you all for the opportunity to be with you today. And I want to just acknowledge each and every one of you for the work you've already done on your journey. Really, truly. And for you yoga teachers who are here right now studying to be yoga teachers, I was in your seat once. I went through the course you're going through. Even after years of studying Ayurveda, I said, no, I want to take the course you're taking because I wanted to learn. I wanted to churn. And when you learn, you churn. You really do. It stimulates something in you. And that stimulation of new ideas, it's all the churning. So many blessings to each of you as you continue your journey. And I want to leave you with one last thought. And that is that when you move through that journey, each step along the way, you will ultimately, ultimately know love. At the very end, there is no difference between the highest love and self-realization. You will become more and more loving through the churning even though it may seem painful at times, have faith. Have faith. And keep on going. Be that mountain. Allow the time. Keep practicing your sadhana. And may Ayurveda keep you well through your journey. Om Namah Shivaya. Namah.